Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is the Reverend Richie Cronin. I'm the minister of two churches here in Cork, Trinity and McCartney Street, and I had a Presbyterian church down in East Cork. And for the next 25 minutes or so, the boys here at True have very kindly given us space to pray a little, read the Bible, and do things that churches normally do when we worship God, except we can't right now because of this virus. The building is closed, but the worship must go on. So, wherever you are, whatever you're up to, just relax a little and listen to this. You mightn't be someone who thinks much about God or Jesus at all. Or you might be one of my regulars at church. Either way, I pray that the Lord will speak to you through his words in these next 25 minutes or so. It mightn't be your normal cup of tea, but the Lord always does something when we listen to his words. So, hold on to your britches. Let me pray first. Actually, before I pray, let me say this. You know, we all have dads. Everyone's got a dad. Even the folks with two mammies have a dad. It's just a fact of life. Now, we mightn't know him, or we might. And some of them aren't great, but most of the time, thankfully, we got enough dads. We got good enough dads. And the Bible actually talks about God as our father. He relates to us as a father does. He's called a mother too a few times, but nowhere as much as he's called our father. But unlike the good enough dads, or the bad dads, or the never seen dads, God is a perfect father, always and forever. Don't forget it. Don't, don't let what your friends tell you, or what you tell, tell you, and change your mind on that. And the Bible presents him as a perfect father. He has the truth about life. He has the best advice. He always listens. He's always there. He sent his son to die for us so we can know that he loves us. Let's talk to him. Father, thank you again for another week above ground. Thank you for any of the blessings that you've given us. We are really grateful for all that you have done for us. And the truth is, Father, we know that we don't know the half of it. All the same, we ask you for uh, more blessings this week, please. We ask for your mercy on our bodies and our health. Spare us and our families, please. Look after them. We ask that particularly for all who are pregnant right now, look after the baby in their bellies. or If they have young kids at home, give them energy, Father. We ask for your blessing on our jobs. We ask that they'd stay or that you'd give us one if we need it. Thanks for the men and women that you've made us, who can work in the first place. And if there's any listening today, Father, who are caught in an addiction or caught up in trouble of some kind, speak to them now and show them a way out of it. Help them to see that your truth and your love is the answer to all things. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Lord. Amen. Um, I'm going to read from the Bible now. <coughs> Uh, you can get a Bible, you know, a lot of days people just Google uh, one of the Gospels or one of the letters of the Bible. Um, you can get a thing called the Bible app, it's very easy to read it. Or you can buy one. Most places, uh, most bookstores will sell you a Bible. But this is from Matthew chapter 18, uh, one of the four Gospels. It's Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. And this is a story of Jesus where he's teaching a few important things about forgiveness. Have you got someone that you need to forgive? Hmm? You have a long standing uh, thing with somebody? Uh, do you know that God, because of Jesus' death on the cross, offers you forgiveness for every single thing that you've done, no matter how bad it was? And you don't need to work to get it off him. You just need to take that forgiveness. Well, these things will come up again in this story. So let's read God's word to us. It goes like this. Then Peter, one of the apostles, came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. 
since he was not able to pay the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt at this the servant fell on his knees before him be patient with me he begged and i will pay back everything the master's or the servant's master took pity on him cancelled the debt and let him go but when that servant went out he found one of his fellow servants who owned him a hundred denarii he grabbed him and began to choke him pay back what you owe me he demanded his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him please be patient with me and i'll pay it back but he refused instead he went off and he had the man drawn in prison until he could pay the debt now when the other servants saw what had happened they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened then the master called the servant in you wicked servant he said i cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to shouldn't you have had the mercy on your fellow servant just as i had on you and in his anger his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed then jesus said this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart this is god's word i was once working with a, a, a woman from estonia and i listened to her talk one time about her complete hatred of people from russia right russians and the whole time she was talking my eyes kept coming back to a little silver cross that was hanging from around her neck i know a lot of people wear crosses but in this instance i was struck by the sheer wrongness of speaking words of hatred but wearing a symbol of forgiveness you can hate evil yeah, and you can denounce those who do it but as a christian you gotta have love for your enemies and forgiveness is a part of that if you don't or if you think you don't then this story is a bit of a problem for you now the story is quite well known <coughs> at least i think it is anyway and before we look at it the context here is a is a series of teachings from jesus where he shows us that god loves those around us as well as ourselves and one thing that that means is that God is keen that we are aware of any way in which our behavior affects the lives and the holiness of the brothers and sisters around us. We are interconnected. We're not independent beings. And our actions have consequences on those around us. So we have to consider what we're doing, not just in terms of between myself and God or for myself, but on how it affects others. And it's into this discussion that Peter asks his kind of response question. He says, if my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Up to seven times? And of course, Peter, who is always the sharpest and the quickest to see the implications of things, he would ask this. It's like he's saying, hold on there now one second, Jesus. If I'm supposed to be living my life with a lot of consideration for the holiness of those around me, and love them all the time well what happens when they do stuff to me how many times am i supposed to forgive them seven times to which of course jesus replies not seven seventy seven and actually the point he's making is clear it's not the word to count to seventy seven it's just that there's no limit at all and then he tells the story that we read earlier to illustrate to us why there is no limit on how much or how often we should forgive Right? So that's the context. So what's the story? Well, firstly, Jesus tells us at the end that the king in the story is God the Father, and the unmerciful servant is a man who refuses to forgive his fellow Christian. Now that said, let me explain it. There was a servant, right, who initially he owes the king 10,000 talents. And I'm told that at uh, this is effectively a nonsensical number it's like saying that the guy owed him a gazillion but unfortunately the grace that was shown the servant where when he was forgiven a gazillion doesn't rub off on him and the contrast that jesus makes is that whereas he was forgiven an enormous amount of debt he does not forgive a man who owes him 100 denarii now, 100 denarii, unlike 10,000 talents, is actually an easily quantifiable number because a, de a denarii is a day's wage. 
So a hundred of them would be about between a, a third and a quarter of your annual income. Not an insignificant number by any means. But the servant, however, forgets the huge kindness that has been shown to him, and he refuses to forgive his fellow servant. The large enough, yes, but much, much smaller debt that he had. And so when the king, who had forgiven him the huge debt, hears about it, he takes it as a personal insult. That another of his servants has been treated like this by someone to whom he had just been very kind to, and he has the first servant put in jail, and actually he says he's tortured till he can pay his debt. So that's him being tortured forever because he ain't going to be paying that thing. Now let's say, okay, right, that this story was today, okay? Public of Ireland, 2020. And twas me that was asked to give between a turn and a quarter of my annual wages, right? So we'll say about maybe 12 grand. And if someone asked me to forgive that, I can tell you no, I wouldn't be too happy. But that's not the point. Yeah, sure, 12 grand is no joke. But if I had just been forgiven the complete GDP of the Republic of Ireland and then I got snippy about someone owing me 12,000 euros, well, what would that say about me? Well, let's say a few couple of things. Firstly, it shows that the grace that was shown to me has not affected my character. I mean, a great thing has just been done to me and yet I can't even do uh, a much, much smaller version of it myself. So it hasn't changed me. Secondly, I seem to have no understanding, or at least I've forgotten very quickly, of how serious my own debt to the king was. There's no humility in me. I haven't paused to consider myself or my actions. I haven't celebrated with my family and friends. I haven't offered away uh, of thanks to the one that has forgiven me my debt. Instead, I just drove on on to the next thing that concerned me. And then thirdly, I also seem to be a bit of an idiot. <laughs> thinking I could uh, deal with this other servant with little thought that the king who had eyes everywhere would find out, which he did. So this servant then hasn't been changed by this amazing grace shown to him. He has no sense of the enormity of what he was led off with and he has no sense that God sees everything he does. And the basic idea then of the story that Jesus is communicating here is if, if we don't forgive the person who comes to us and asks for forgiveness, even when it is big, we're like this fella. And he was forgiven a great deal by the king, but it didn't change him. He didn't grasp how great a thing it was, his forgiveness, and he didn't grasp that God will see all he does, including his hypocrisy. Peter is asked many times, how many times, sorry, are we supposed to forgive those who sin against us? And Jesus is saying that if you're asking that question, you've missed just how great it is that our king has offered to forgive us. And by the way, you know, Jesus is working here off an assumption that his listeners know that, that everything wrong that we do is actually done against God. It doesn't matter if you let down your spouse or your kids or your colleagues or your neighbours. All of it ultimately is done against God. I mean, of course, you can directly sin against him too. You know, the first four commandments. Put God first, worship him right, respect his name, keep one day a week for him. They're against him. like. But after that, any time that we sin against people, we're actually always too sinning against God. King David, an Old Testament hero, he said after he committed adultery, he said, against you and you alone, O Lord, have I sinned. And that way of looking at sin is what Jesus and his listeners were operating out of here. So in the end, Jesus doesn't fully explain this parable, but instead he assumes that his meaning is clear. We have been forgiven a great deal by God, so we have to forgive all that is asked of us. Why do we have to do that? Because although the debt owed to the servant was not minor, and so Jesus is also saying that whatever is done against you, whatever you are asked to forgive, it's not a small thing, nor should it be discounted. The point is that in comparison, however bad the thing that was done to us, what we do to God is simply not in the same league. And so if he forgives us, 
that through Jesus' death on the cross, he offers that forgiveness to all of us. If he forgives us, then we have to forgive others. There is no... There is no other way of looking at it. If we don't forgive others, actually the Lord will extract payment for our debt in another way. Which is to say here actually that Jesus is talking about hell. A horrible place and yet one that does Jesus doesn't avoid talking about. No, I'm not going to talk about it really today here. But it's in here. And suffice to say he assigns a place in it for those who despite all that God has forgiven them they remain unwilling to do likewise for others. Showing actually truly that they've never understood what he offered in the first place. But as I said, the main thrust of what Jesus is getting at here is that in light of what God has done for us, we must forgive all in any that comes our way. Because what has been done to us doesn't compare to what we have done to God. Now, that point particularly... If you don't understand it, you won't really get this. And the truth is, actually a lot of people don't like this business. Even from an intellectual viewpoint, not just a, a kind of a gut level or life experience view. How can you say that what has been done to us doesn't compare to what we have done to God? And there's two reasons why we struggle with this. I think firstly we underestimate the holiness of the one a whom against we are sinning. I mean imagine right like think of it like this. Imagine you get a helicopter and you were to fly up to the top of Mount Everest. Now I'm told actually that it's not possible, but let's say that you were able to go up to the top, right? And you get up to the top and you've brought with you a big uh, Kango hammer, right? Then you're up at the very top and you you know, you're digging into the top of it and you take about 15 foot, 20 foot off the top of Mount Everest and you just push it over the side. It'd be war! The Chinese would have you in jail for decades. But why? It's, you know, it's just rocks. No. It's completely disrespectful. There's something inherent to Mount Everest that makes it special. The same thing is true of God. And yet there's no comparisons to be made. Mount Everest is special to the world, but God created life. He created you and your family and your friends. It's not that there is just a, a special inherent quality to him. Because of him, things like specialness, inherentness, qualities exist. He's God. He made us, he saved us, he gives us everything good that we have. The Bible teaches that he is infinite, eternal, glorious, perfect. He knows everything. He is everywhere. He is all-powerful. He is most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, abundant in goodness and truth. To do something against him or one of his creations, even the slightest of things against him, is horrible. Sin is horrible because of who we sin against. And to be forgiven of it then is a great big deal. And Jesus is saying that, like the man in the story, we are forgiven, actually, the death of a gazillion. The main thing that galls the king in this story is that the king's mercy wasn't replicated. And even in minuscule. Because the king's mercy is unbelievable. It's huge. And that's for you and me. And if we can't replicate it in our lives to those who trouble us, well, that ain't right, says Jesus. You've got to forgive. And then secondly, the second thing that stops us from taking this idea that our, our sins uh, against God are, are, are infinitely worse than anything that's happened to us is our inability to, to, to see that Actually, we're, <laughs> we're not doing as good as we think we are. And of course, I've often said on here, you know, modern life hates admitting our weaknesses, uh, not just because we, we can be proud, but because the prevailing method of getting through times is very often positive thinking, positive vibes, surround yourself with good friends, etc. And there's, there, there is a limit to that, which is, is perfectly acceptable, but a sober and honest appraisal of yourself is not always in favour. And in the Bible too, we read things like Paul saying that we must do everything by faith and that whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And yet how often are our actions either not by faith or not for the concern of God's glory? 
And that's even before we get into our motives for doing things, which are so often mixed and selfish and have concerns beyond what's uh, apparent to others. The point I want you to see is that our failings are very pervasive and unending and multi-layered and hidden and sometimes disguised as good things. And yes, we might have done all right in life in comparison to folks that we know, folks that we see on TV, but each one of us has a lot to be forgiven of. And thank God, because of the cross, that we can indeed be. In the end, the teaching of this scripture is that our sins against the Holy God are only forgiven through a great act of mercy and grace. And so in your own relationship, Jesus is saying, go and do likewise, if you are called to. You know, I've spent a, a good few years, uh, six years, in Belfast. And in my time in the north, I, I, had, I met a good few people, actually, who had fem family members or friends uh, killed by paramilitaries or persons unknown or the various forces of the state. And they'd often say to you, you know, I can't forgive them, Richie. You know, often, upon examination, it would become apparent that their Christian faith, if indeed they had one, was, you know, wasn't a big thing in their lives. And in that case, I can see why they would not feel a great urge to forgive. But there was other folk too, including one woman in a, the church I was in, who actually saw her husband getting shot in front of her. And it was her fate that moved her to forgive her husband's killers. Now, she would say that how she was able to do that was that the Holy Spirit empowered her to do it, and actually still today. It was still, it was, sorry, a supernatural act. Now, in cases like that, it does appear miraculous, as if the Holy Spirit had descended in a special way to help this lady forgive her husband's killers. But the truth is that every time we forgive as a Christian, it's an act of of the Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does is quite simply he's, he's helping us to live like the servant should have done. That lady who forgave her husband's murderers knows that she too was forgiven of her sins. How could she not forgive those men? And again we're back to the idea of faith. Do you think that your sins against God are deserving of a severe punishment by him such that whatever was done against you doesn't compare to what we've done to him? That is at the heart of what we believe as Christians. So we must forgive, especially if it is asked of us. You know, there's a different discussion to be had of what to do if, if they don't ask. And I could talk about that as well, but we don't have time. But in that case, I'd say, you know, just quickly, I'd say, in that case, I'd say, well, you have to love them anyway and be willing to offer it and have a disposition of kindness to them. I've often seen folks say, well, he, she hasn't asked for forgiveness, so I'm not going to give, have anything to do with them. Well, that's not Christian either. And I'll say this too, the necessity of forgiving people as a Christian does not mean that you have to go towards an abuser or that you have to leave them off if they are hurting you. It takes loving to leave people get away with their stuff either. Being forgiven does not mean that you are a doormat. But what is forgiveness anyway well let me tell you three things that it's not firstly forgiveness is not trying to forget about it forgetting can often come out of it but forgiveness is not solely an attempt at forgetting when we try to forget what has happened to us without facing up to it that stuff don't go away this is a familiar theme in TV and cinema the repressed feelings of anger and then of course in most films anyway one day it all comes out in a hurried and badly handled way. So forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness is not about trying to uh, just be civil to the person that you hate. I was betrayed uh, in college. A friend of mine with a girlfriend of mine. And that was the end of our friendship. Though we were always civil to each other. I'd see him around and I'd say hello, but that was it. I didn't want anything to do with him. You know, I felt like he'd stab me in the back. Now you could say, you know, well done, you didn't get in the fight with him. I didn't berate him to his face or even behind his back. But on the inside, I couldn't stand him. 
And that wasn't forgiveness either. Not being outwardly bad to the person is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is also not a once-off thing. You don't just decide to do it, do it, and then it's done. There may indeed be many instances like that, but some hearts take a good few goes. There may even be people close to you right now that you will need to practice forgiveness to as long as they're alive. So there's a few things it's not, but what is it? Well, firstly, to forgive someone means that you refuse to make them pay. And then secondly, often at the very same time, you got to pay a bit of a price instead yourself. Right? Now look, it's easier to let it go on. It's easier to fester on it, to ignore, to hide from it. it. It's hard, I know, to love again and again, especially when there's a good chance that not only will it not be appreciated, but it might even be used against you. But my friends, that's the way of the cross. That is the fulfillment of God's moral law. It is the way that the Spirit leads. Jesus didn't just refuse to deal with us as we deserve. He moved towards us. He came down to earth. He lived as close to humanity as is possible. And for every waking moment of his life, he loved us. That is the example our Lord gave us. Sounds hard. But he who did all of that now lives in us by his spirit. And he gives us the power to do the same thing. It's not impossible. And it's good to do it. I'll leave you with this last example of a guy who had to forgive. <coughs> and in this instance, he wasn't asked for forgiveness. But he had to treat her well. He said, this is, it goes like this. Once upon a time, I was engaged to a young woman who changed her mind. I forgive her, but only in small sums over a year. They were made whenever I spoke to her and refrained from rehashing the past. Whenever I renounced jealousy and self-pity, whenever I saw her with another man, whenever I praised her to others when I wanted to slice away at her reputation, those were the payments I made, but she never saw them. And her own payments were unseen by me, but I do know that she forgave me. Forgiveness is more than a matter of refusing to hate someone. It's also a matter of choosing to demonstrate love and acceptance to the offender. Pain is the consequence of sin. There is no easy way to deal with it. But wood, nails and pain are the currency of forgiveness, the love that heals. Folks, we must forgive because we were forgiven of all of our sins against God. We must forgive because it's one way, a crucial way, that we love people. And we must forgive because if we don't, we won't be forgiven either. Shine on scale. Let me pray. May the Lord help us all this week to know how much he loves you. May any of you who need to forgive and are finding it hard and draw strength from his Holy Spirit and may there be surprising healing in all your relationships. I pray that every last one of us, if we don't already, who is listening to this would know that all of our sins, the gazillion of them, big, small, little, middling ones we forgot are forgiven by God if we've just but asked for him. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, my name again is the Reverend Richie Cronin. I the minister of two Presbyterian churches here on Cork. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find us on Facebook at Trinity Presbyterian Cork or Ahada Presbyterian. And you have been listening to me on True Radio Cork, supporting the community. God bless you all, folks, and remember, spread the word, not the virus.